It's time for special free. It's time for a special free for kids. Start up your morning. Start your day with us. We'll come to see you sitting beside your radio. We'll be your buddies under the unknown. Sparky Droid and Charlie Brown We're coming your way on especially for kids Yeah 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 Four minutes after ten o'clock, good morning This is especially for kids and I'm the real Charlie Brown Sparky and Unger didn't make it this week Who knows why those guys, sometimes, they just seem to get lost and can't find them in time. But we do have some other people here in the studio who we're going to meet in uh, just a minute. Coming up uh, in just a few minutes, we will have the conclusion to The Horse and His Boy, the C.S. Lewis book from the Chronicles of Narnia. We've got music from Sparky and Unger. Fortunately, they leave us some songs on tape. Now this week we're going to be finishing A Horse and His Boy, and starting next week, uh, on Saturday next week, we will begin, uh, in addition to the, the new book from Narnia called The Magician's Nephew, we will we'll also be having uh, an adventure from Agape Land. We will have uh, one chapter of Narnia next week and one of the adventures from Agape Land, and you'll find out more about that as, as uh, the program progresses next week. And finally this week, coming up later in the program, we have the winners of the Far Out Contest, which was our contest to find out uh, who would write from the furthest away from here at the radio station, which is located in the north end of Columbus. And uh, I got out my fancy slide rule and figured out who was the furthest one away, and we've, we uh, have some winners that we'll notify you of a little bit later in the hour. So I think before we do anything else, we should find out who the guests are here in the studio. Let's have one of you guys stand up. Who's going to be first? Now come on over here and talk in the mic and just say, tell me, tell me what your name is. My name is Andy Wall and I come from Smyrna Baptist Church. Andy, what, what's your last name? Bond. Bond, Andy Bond from Smyrna Baptist Church. Huh? Tell your mom. Hi, love. <laughs> okay, who's going to be next? That didn't hurt too much, did it, Andy? No. Okay, who's next? What's your name? What what's your name? My name is Antoine. I'm from Smyrna. Hi, Mom and Dad. What's your last name, Antoine? Childs. Childs. Antoine Childs. Okay, who's next? My name is... <laughs> My name is... Isaiah <laughs> Ball. I'm from Smyrna Baptist Church. Hi, Mom. Hi, Pastor Marshall. Hi, Pastor Marshall. Okay, who's next? What's your name? Atika. Yeah, talk loud. What is it? Latika? Oh. Artika. Artika? What's your last name? Samuel. Dickerson. 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 And you come from where? What church? Do you know the name? Is it Smyrna, Smyrna Baptist, Baptist Church? Church? Okay. And who's who's next? We got what, one more? Who's I'm next? Kevin Jones, and I come from Smyrna Baptist Church. Kevin Jones. Now, that's the interesting thing that we've noted here is that all of these people are from Smyrna Baptist Church. Now, we have a couple of adults in the studio as well as the shorter people, so let's, uh, let's get some introductions here also. Your name is? Deacon Bond for Smyrna Baptist Church. Deacon Bond. I'm glad to be here this morning and hoping that everyone from Smyrna Baptist Church is listening. Yeah, let's hope so. We can use all the all listeners right. we can get. And if not, turn on. <laughs> that's right. If you're not listening, be sure to turn on your radio right now. And also, my name's Twyla Jones. I'm the beginner Sunday school class teacher. And uh, we've had mail from you before. In the past, you sent us those nice little, uh, what do you call those things? Visors? Uh -huh. Visors. And they say, what, what does it say? Can you guys say it out loud? What's it say? Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Okay. Now, I heard a rumor. I, this probably isn't true. But I heard a rumor that you guys like to sing. Is that true? Yes. Do you? Now, I, I heard a rumor that uh, that you know... You know a song uh, called It's a Bubblin? Is that the name of it? Yeah. Now, why don't you guys all stand up and come over near the microphone? I think that, that the people that are listening to the show would just love to hear this song. 
Let me move the mic a little bit. All right. Now, you guys, you guys watch over here and go ahead and sing the song. Everybody's listening. The whole world's listening. So don't be nervous, okay? It's a bubbling. It's a bubbling. It's a bubbling in my soul. I sing it. I shout it. Since Jesus made me whole, some people don't understand it. But this one thing I know, it's a bubbling, a bubbling, a bubbling. It's a bubbling in my soul. It's a bubbling. It's a bubbling. It's a bubbling in my soul. I sing it. I shout it. Since Jesus made me whole, some people don't understand it. But this one thing I know, that it's a bubbling, a bubbling, a bubbling. It's a bubbling in my soul. Boy, you guys, I, I well, I have to at least clap. We, we don't have a very big audience here that can clap back. That was terrific. I appreciate that. And you guys... You guys are uh, going to sit down now and, and uh, kind of watch how the program goes. Sparky and Unger are going to sing. And uh, we've, we've gotten all the names of all the kids that came in today for our birthday club. So when their birthdays come around, we're going to sing Happy Birthday over the radio. So that's pretty exciting. I'm glad you guys came up today. It's, it's, it's fun to watch you sing because you know what happens when you guys sing? These big, the corners of your mouth go up. I don't, I, I don't understand it, but your face changes. Even if you, you look kind of sad or something, the, the little corners of your mouth just kind of go up in the air. Did you ever notice that about it when you sing? No. Do you know what? Do you, you know what? You suppose you know what that is? Smile. You're smiling. Yeah, that's it. All right. Well, you guys, I'm glad you're here today, and uh, you, you make yourselves comfortable. And, and in just a second here, we're going to be reading from uh, The Horse and His Boy. We're going to finish that book today. Now, we've got other music, as I mentioned, contest winners and other things coming up in just a couple of minutes right here on Especially for Kids with The Real Charlie Brown.
13 minutes past 10 o'clock. Do you guys, any, any of you guys know what that song was that uh, Sparky taped for us? No. Nope. Jesus. Say it loud. This, this, I, this I know for the world. Jesus loves me. Yeah. That's it. That's right. Okay. Now you guys make yourselves comfortable. It's time for us to start the story here for this morning. This is really exciting. I've never been able to, to read Narnia with, uh, with an audience before in the studio. Chapter 14 of uh, The Horse and His Boy is called How Bree Became a Wiser Horse. Do you know, have you guys heard any parts of this story before? Any of you listened before? Yeah. To the story of Bree and Shasta? And some of you have. Okay. So some of you know that, that this story is partly about two talking horses and a little boy and a little girl. And, of course... Edmund and Peter and Susan and Lucy, who seems like most of the Narnia books are partly about them. Well, we must now return to Erebus and the horses. The hermit watching his pool was able to tell them that Shasta was not killed or even seriously wounded, for he saw him get up and saw how affectionately he was greeted by King Loon. But as he could only see, not hear, he didn't know what anyone was saying. And once the fighting had stopped and the talking had begun, it wasn't worthwhile looking in the pool any longer. And the next morning, while the hermit was indoors, the three of them discussed what they should do next. Well, I've had enough of this, said Huynh. Huynh is the, the girl talking horse. The hermit has been very good to us, and I'm much obliged to him, I'm sure. But I'm getting as fat as a pet pony, eating all day and getting no exercise. Let's go to Narnia. Oh, not today, ma'am, said Bree. I wouldn't hurry things. Some other day, don't you think? We must see Shasta first and, and, and say goodbye to him and apologize, said Erebus. Exactly, said Bree with great enthusiasm. That's just what I was going to say. Oh, of course, said Wynne. I, I expect he's in Anvard. Naturally, we'd look in on him and say goodbye, but, but that's on our way. And why shouldn't we start at once? After all, I thought it was Narnia we all wanted to get to. Well, I suppose so, said Erebus. She was beginning to wonder what exactly she would do when she got there, and she was starting to feel lonely. Of course, of course, said Bree hastily, but there's no need to rush things, if you know what I mean. No, I don't know what you mean, said Huynh. Why don't you want to go? Hmm, brew-hoo, muttered Bree. Well, don't you see, ma'am, it's an important occasion returning to one's own country. Entertaining society, the best society, it's so essential to make a good impression. Not perhaps looking quite ourselves yet, eh? Quinn broke out into a horse laugh. <laughs> it's your tail, Bree. I see it all now. You want to wait till your tail's grown again. We don't even know if tails are worn long in Narnia. Really, Bree, you're as vain as that Tarquina in Tashban. You are silly, Bree, said Erebus. By the lion's mane, Tarquina, I'm nothing of the sort, said Bree. I have a proper respect for myself and my fellow horses, that's all. Bree, said Erebus, who was not very interested in the cut of his tail, said, I, I've been wanting to ask you something for a long time. Why do you keep on swearing by the lion and by the lion's mane? I thought you hated lions. Uh, so I do, said Bree. But when I speak of the lion, of course, I mean Aslan, the great deliverer of Narnia, who drove away the white witch in the winter. All Narnians swear by him. Is he a lion? Well, no, of course not, said Bree in a rather shocked voice. All the stories about him in Tashban say he is. And if he isn't a lion, why do you call him a lion, said Erebus. Well, you'd hardly understand that at your age. I was only a little foal when I left, so I don't quite understand it fully myself. Bree was standing with his back to the green wall while he said this, and the other two were facing him. He was talking in a rather superior tone with his eyes half shut, that's why he didn't see the changed expression in the faces of Huynh and Erebus. Well, they had good reason to have their mouths drop open and their eyes stare, because while Bree spoke, they saw an enormous lion leap up from outside and balance itself on the top of the green wall. 
only it was a brighter yellow and it was bigger and more beautiful and more alarming than any lion they'd ever seen before. And at once it jumped down inside the wall and began approaching Bree from behind. Do you think it's going to get him? That big lion, do you think it's going get, to get Bree, the horse? Well, let's read on. He had made no noise at all. And when and Erebus couldn't make any noise themselves, no more than if they were frozen. No doubt, continued Bree, when they speak of him as a lion, they only mean he's as strong as a lion, or, or to our enemies, of course, as fierce as a lion, or something of that kind. Even a little girl like you, Erebus, must see that it would be quite absurd to suppose he is a real lion. Indeed, it would be disrespectful. If he was a lion, he'd have to be a beast just like the rest of us. Why... <laughs> If he was a lion, he'd have four paws and a tail and whiskers. Oh, oh ha, help! For just as he said the word whiskers, one of Aslan's whiskers had actually tickled his ear. Bree shot away like an arrow to the other side of the enclosure, and there he turned. The wall was too high for him to jump, and he couldn't run any further. Erebus and Wynne both started back. There was about a second of intense silence. And then Wynne though shaking all over, gave a, a strange little neigh and, and trotted across to the lion. Please, she said, you're so beautiful. You may eat me if you like. I'd sooner be eaten by you than fed by anyone else. Dearest daughter, said Aslan, planting a lion's kiss on her twitching velvet nose, I knew you would not be long in coming to me. Joy shall be yours. Then he lifted his head and spoke in a louder voice. Now, Bree, you poor, proud, frightened horse, draw near. Nearer still, my son. Do not dare not to touch me. Touch me. Smell me. Here are my paws. Here is my tail. These are my whiskers. I am a true beast. But Aslan, said Bree, in a shaken voice, I'm afraid I, I, I must be rather a fool. Happy the horse who knows that while he is that while he is still young, or the human either. Draw near, Erebus, my daughter. See, my paws are velveted. You will not be torn this time. This time, sir, said Erebus. It was I who wounded you, said Aslan. I am the only lion you met in all your journeyings. Do you know why I tore you? No, sir. The scratches on your back, tear for tear, throb for throb, blood for blood, were equal to the stripes laid on the back of your stepmother's slave because of the drugged sleep you cast upon her. You needed to know what it felt like. Yes, sir. Please ask on, my dear. Will any more harm come to her by what I did? Child, said the lion, I am telling you your story, not hers. No one is told any story but their own. And then he shook his head, and he spoke in a lighter voice. Be merry, little ones. We shall meet again soon, but before that you will have another visitor. Then in one bound he reached the top of the wall and vanished from sight. Strange to say, they felt no inclination to talk to one another about him after he had gone. They all moved slowly away to different parts of the quiet grass, and there they paced to and fro, each alone, thinking, about half an hour later, the two horses were summoned to the back of the house to eat something nice that the hermit had gotten ready for them. And Erebus, still walking and thinking, was startled by the harsh sound of a trumpet outside the gate. "'Who's there?' said Erebus. "'His Royal Highness Prince Cor of Arkenland,' said a voice from outside. Well, Erebus undid the door and opened it, drawing back a little way to let the strangers in. Two soldiers with halberds came first and took their stand at each side of the entry. Then followed a herald and the trumpeter. His Royal Highness Prince Cor of Arkenland desires an audience of the Lady Erebus, said the herald. Then he and the trumpeter drew aside and bowed, and the soldiers saluted, and the prince himself came in. All his attendants withdrew, and they closed the gate behind them. The prince bowed, a very clumsy bow for a prince it was. Erebus curtsied in the Kalormin style, which is not at all like ours. And she did it very well, because, of course, she'd been taught how to do it well. Then she looked up and saw what sort of person this prince was. She saw a mere boy. He was bareheaded, and his fair hair was encircled with a very thin band of gold, hardly thicker than a wire. His upper tunic was of white cambric, as fine as a handkerchief, so that the bright red tunic beneath it showed through. 
His left hand, which rested on the enameled sword hilt, was bandaged. Erebus looked twice at his face before she gasped and said, Why, it's Shasta. Shasta all at once turned very red and began speaking very quickly. Look here, Erebus, I do hope you won't think I'm all got up like this and the trumpeter and all to try to impress you or to make out that I'm different or any rod of that sort, because I'd far rather have come in my old clothes, but they've been burnt now. They burned his old clothes. And my father said, Your father? Apparently King Loon is my father. I might really have guessed it, Corin being so like me. We were twins, you see. Oh, and my name isn't Shasta. My name is Cor. Cor is a nicer name than Shasta, said Erebus. Brothers' names run like that in Arkenland, or, said Shasta, or Prince Cor, as we must now call him, like Dar and Darren and Cole and Colin and, 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 and so on. Shasta, I mean Cor, no, no, I've got to say something at once. I'm sorry I've been such a pig, but I did change before I knew you were a prince. Honestly, I did, when you came back and, fa and faced the lion. It wasn't really going to kill you at all, that lion, said Cor. I know, said Erebus. Both were still and solemn for a moment, as each saw that the other one knew about Aslan. Suddenly Erebus remembered Cor's bandaged hand. I say, I forgot, you've been in a battle, is that a wound? Oh, it's a mere scratch, said Cor, using for the first time a rather lordly tone. But a moment later he burst out laughing and said, Well, if you want to know the truth, it isn't a proper wound at all. I only skinned my knuckles, just as any clumsy fool might do, with, without going near a battle at all. Still, you were in the battle. It must have been wonderful. It wasn't at all like I thought it would be, said Cor. But, she I, I mean, Cor... You haven't told me anything about King Loon and how he found out who you were. Well, let's sit down. It's a rather long story. And by the way, Father is an absolute brick. And by the way, I'd be just as pleased, or very nearly, finding he's my father, even if he wasn't a king, even though education and all sorts of horrible things are going to happen to me. Is it horrible to go to school, you guys? No, it's good, isn't it? He just didn't know, because he'd never been to school. But you want the story. Anyway, Corin and I were twins, and, and about a week after we were both born, apparently they took us to a wise old centaur in Narnia to be blessed or something. Now this centaur was a prophet, as, as a good many centaurs are. Perhaps you haven't seen any centaurs yet. There were some in the battle yesterday, most remarkable people, but I, I can't say I feel quite at home with them yet. I say, Erebus, there are going to be a lot of things to get used to in these northern countries. Yes, there are, said Erebus, but get on with the story. Well, as soon as he saw Corin and me, it seems this centaur looked at me and said, A day will come when that boy will save Arkenland from the deadliest danger in which he ever lay. So, of course, my father and mother were very pleased. But there was someone present who wasn't. He was a chap called Lord Barr, who had been father's Lord Chancellor. And apparently he'd done something wrong. Bezling, or some word like that. Uh, I didn't understand that part very well. And father had to dismiss him. But nothing else was done to him, and he was allowed to go on living in Arkenland. But he must have been as bad as he could be, for it came out afterward he had been in the pay of the Tisrock, and he'd sent a lot of secret information to Tashban. So as soon as he heard I was going to save Arkenland from a great danger, he decided I must be put out of the way. Well, he succeeded in kidnapping me, I don't really know how, and he rode away down the winding arrow to the coast. He had everything prepared, and there was a ship manned with his own followers lying ready for him, and he put out to sea with me on board. But father got wind of it though not quite in time, and he was after him as quickly as he could be. The Lord Barr was already at sea when Father reached the coast, but not out of sight, and Father was embarked in one of his own warships within twenty minutes. It must have been a wonderful chase. There were six days fo following Barr's galleon, and brought her to battle on the seventh. It was a great sea fight. I heard a lot about it yesterday evening, from ten o'clock in the morning till sunset. Our people took the ship in the end, but I wasn't there. The Lord Barr himself had been killed in the battle, but one of his men said that early in the morning, as soon as he saw he was certain to be overhauled, Barr had given me to one of his knights and sent us both away in the ship's boat. But that boat was never to be seen again. Of course, that was the same boat that Aslan, he seems to be at the back of all these stories. He pushed ashore at the right place for Arshish to pick me up. I wish I knew that knight's name, for he must have kept me alive and starved himself to do it. I suppose Aslan would say that was part of someone else's story. I wasn't forgetting that, said Cor. And I wonder how the prophecy will work out, said Erebus, and what the great danger is that you're to save Arkenland from. Well, said Cor rather awkwardly, they seem to think I've done it already. Erebus clapped her hands. Why, of course, how stupid I am! 
and how wonderful Arkenland can never be in much greater danger than when Rabidash had crossed the arrow with his two hundred horsemen, and you hadn't yet got through with your message. Don't you feel proud? Oh, I think I feel a little bit scared, said Cor. You'll be living at Anvard now, said Erevis, rather wistfully. Oh, I'd nearly forgotten what I came about. Father wants you to come and live with us. He says there's been no lady in our court. They call it the court, I don't know why, since Mother died. Please come, Erevis. You'll like Father and Corin. They're not like me. They've been properly brought up. You needn't be afraid. Oh, stop it, said Erevis, or we'll have a real fight. Of course I'll come. Now let's go and see the horses, said Cor. There was a great and joyous meeting between Bree and Cor, and Bree, who was still in a rather subdued frame of mind, agreed to set out for Anvard at once. He and Wynne would, would cross into Narnia on the following day. All four bade an affectionate farewell to the hermit, and they promised that they would visit him again soon. By about the middle of the morning they were on their way. The horses had explained that Erebus and Cor would ride, but Cor explained that, except in war, where everyone else must do what he can do best, no one in Narnia or Arkenland ever dreamed of mounting a talking horse. That meant nobody was going to be riding Bree anymore. This reminded poor Bree again of how little he knew about Narnian customs and what dreadful mistakes he might make. So while Wynne strolled along in a happy dream, Bree got more nervous and more self-conscious with every step he took. Buck up, Bree, said Cor. It's far worse for me than for you. You aren't going to be educated. I'll be learning how to read and write and, and dance and, and, and history and music. While you'll be galloping and rolling on the hills of Narnia to your heart's content. But that's just the point, groaned Bree. Do talking horses roll? Supposing they don't, I, I can't bear to give it up. What do you think, Wynne? Well, I'm going to roll anyway, said Wynne. I don't suppose any of them will care two lumps of sugar whether you roll or not. Are we near that castle? said Bree to Cor. Well, round the next bend, said the prince. Well, I'm going to have a good one now. It may be my last roll. Wait for me. And Bree got down and he rolled around in the grass, just like a horse. It was five minutes before he rose again, blowing hard and, and covered with bits of bracken. Now I'm ready, he said in a voice of profound gloom. Lead on, Prince Cor. Narnia and the North. But he looked more like a horse going to a funeral than a long-lost captive returning to home and freedom. Chapter 15 is called Rabidash the Ridiculous. And we'll read that in a few minutes here on Especially for Kids with the real Charlie Brown and a bunch of kids from Smyrna Baptist Church, huh? Yes. Here we go, Unger. Okay. J -E -S 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 -S. J-E-S-U-S. Jesus, Jesus is, is our Lord and Savior. All right, get funky, guys. Jesus, Jesus, he's the one. No other God is like him. He gave, he gave his life for us. No other God is like him. Him. J E S U S. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Do it, Spark. Though we used all our muscles and all of our nerves, we still can't praise Him like He deserves. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Try as we may, try though we might, we can love no other God, for He is the light. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. J E S U S. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Well, he is the truth, and he is the way, and we live our lives by what he say. By what he say? Let's try it with better English. Okay. Yes, we live by the word, the word that we heard, and we pray by the name, the most excellent name. It's above all others, and it's there to stay. And as long as we're able, we're going to say it. J-E-S-U-S. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Deep in the cave of the human heart is a monster's lair, all grimy and dark. If for just a moment you forget what you're about, and open, open up the door, door crack, there's hardly any doubt. The monsters will get you, you better watch out. The monsters will get you, you better watch out. Disguise. While low tyrant ever lurks behind 
behind your back. Watch as his chance for it. Sneak at that. Hypnotize your mind, make the bad look good. The cruel kind. He bribes behavior with temptation sweet. Then he's got you. Get a mirror. Take a look at a cheat. If just a moment, you forget what you brought them out from among trees, and, and there across the green lawns, sheltered from the north wind by the high wooded ridge at its back, they saw the castle of Anvard. It was very old and built of a warm reddish brown stone. Before they'd reached the gate, King Loon came out to meet them, not looking at all like Erebus's idea of a king, and wearing the oldest of old clothes, for he had just come from making a round at the kennels with his huntsmen, and he'd only stopped for a moment to wash his doggy hands. But the bow with which he greeted Erebus as he took her hand would have been stately enough for an emperor. Little lady, he said, we bid you very heartily welcome. If my dear wife were still alive, we could make you better cheer, but, but could not do it with a better will. And I'm sorry that you've had misfortunes and been driven from your father's house, which cannot be but a grief to you. My son Cor has told me about your adventures together and all your valor. It was he who did all that, sir, said Erebus. Why, he rushed at a lion to save me. Eh, what's that? I haven't heard that part of the story. Well, then Erebus told that part of the story, and Cor, who had very much wanted the story to be known, though he felt like he couldn't tell it himself, didn't enjoy it so much as he'd expected. And indeed, he felt rather foolish. But his father enjoyed it very much indeed, and in the course of the next few weeks he told it to so many people that Cor wished it had never happened. Then the king turned to Quinn and Bree, and he was just as polite to them as Erebus, and he asked them a lot of questions about their families and where they lived in Narnia before they'd been captured. The horses were rather tongue-tied, for they weren't yet used to talking to being talked to as equals by humans, grown-up humans, that is. They didn't mind Erebus and Cor. Well, presently, Queen Lucy came out from the castle and joined them, and King Loon said to Erebus, My dear, here is a loving friend of our house, and she's been seeing that your apartments are put to rights for you better than I could have done it. You'd like to come and see them, wouldn't you? said Lucy, kissing Erebus. They liked each other at once, and soon they went away together and talked about Erebus's bedroom and Erebus's boudoir and about getting clothes for her and all the sorts of things girls talk about on such an occasion. After lunch, when they had on the terrace cold birds and cold game pie and wine and bread and cheese, King Loon ruffled up his brow and heaved a sigh and said, I owe we still have that sorry creature Rabidash on our hands, my friends, and must needs resolve what to do with him. Lucy was sitting on the king's right and Erebus on his left. King Edmund sat at one end of the table and the Lord Darren faced him at the other. Dar and Peridon and Cor and Corin were on the same side as the king. Your majesty would have a perfect right to strike off his head, said Peridon. Such an assault as he made puts him on a level with assassins. It's very true, said Edmund, but, but even a traitor may mend. I've known that one that did. And he looked very thoughtful. To kill this Rabidash would go near to raising a war with the Tisrock, said Darren. A fig for the Tisrock, said King Loon. His strength is in numbers, and numbers will never cross the desert. But I have no stomach for killing men, even traitors, in cold blood. To have cut his throat in the battle would have eased my heart mightily, but this is a different thing. By my counsel, said Lucy, your majesty shall give him another trial. Let him go free on straight promise of fair dealing in the future. It may be that he will keep his word. Maybe apes will grow on us too, sister, said Edmund. But by the lion, if he breaks it again, it may be in such time and place that any of us could strike him down in clean battle. It shall be tried. Send for the prisoner, friend. Rabidash was brought before them in chains. To look at him, anyone would have supposed that he'd passed the night in a noisome dungeon without food or water. But in reality, he'd been shut up in a, a comfortable room and, and provided with an excellent supper. But he was sulking far too furiously to touch the supper, and he'd spent the whole night stamping and roaring and cursing. He naturally did not now look his best. Your Royal Highness needs not to be told that by the law of nations, as well as by all reasons of prudent policy, we have a, as good a right to your head as ever one mortal man had against another. Nevertheless, in consideration of your youth and the ill-nurture, devoid of all gentil ease and courtesy which you have doubtless had in the land of slaves and tyrants, we are disposed to set you free, unharmed, on these conditions. First, that curse you for a barbarian dog, sputtered Rabidash. Do you think I will even hear your conditions? Ha! 
You talk very largely of nurture, and I know not what. It's easy to a man in chains. Ha! Take off these vile bonds, give me a sword, and let any one of you who dares then debate with me. Nearly all the lords sprang to their feet, and Corin shouted, Father, can I box him, please? Peace, your majesties, my lords, said King Loon. Have we no more gravity among us than to be so chafed by the taunt of such a man as this? Sit down, Corin, or shalt leave the table. I ask your highness again to hear our conditions. I hear no conditions from barbarians and sorcerers. Not one of you dare touch a hair on my head. Every insult you've heaped on me shall be paid with oceans of Narnia and Arkenland blood. Terrible shall the vengeance of the Tisrock be, even now. But kill me, and the burnings and the torturings in the northern lands shall become a tale to frighten the world a thousand years hence. Beware, beware, beware! The bolt of Tash falls from above. <laughs> Does it ever get caught on a hook halfway? asked Horan. Shame, Corin, said the king. Never taunt a man, save when he is stronger than you, then as you please. Oh, you <laughs> foolish rabidash, said Lucy. Well, the next moment, Cor wondered why everyone at the table had risen and was standing perfectly still. Of course, he did the same himself, and then he saw the reason. Aslan was coming. Uh, he was among them, though no one had seen him coming. Rabidash started at the immense shape of the lion as it paced softly in between him and his accusers. Rabidash, said Aslan, take heed. Your doom is very near, but you may still avoid it. Forget your pride. What have you to be proud of, and your anger? Who has done you wrong? And accept the mercy of these good kings." Then Rabidash rolled his eyes and spread out his mouth into a, a horrible, long, mirthless grin like a shark, and he wagged his ears up and down. Anyone can learn how to do this if he takes the trouble. He'd always found this very effective in Kalorman. The bravest had trembled when he made these faces, and ordinary people had fallen to the floor, and sensitive people had often fr fainted. But what Rabidash hadn't realized is that it's very easy to frighten people who know you can have them boiled alive the moment you give them the word. The grimaces didn't look at all alarming in Arkenland. Indeed, Lucy only thought Rabidash was going to be sick. <clears throat> demon, demon, demon! I know you. You are the foul fiend of Narnia. You are the enemy of the gods. Learn who I am, horrible phantasm. I am descended from Tash, the inexorable, the irresistible. The curse of Tash is upon you. Lightning in the shape of scorpion shall be rained on you. The mountains of Narnia shall be gar ground into dust. The Have a care, Rabidash, said Aslan quietly. The doom is nearer now. It is at the door. It has lifted the lash. Let the skies fall! Let the earth gape! Let blood and fire obliterate the world! But be sure I will never desist till I have dragged to my palace by her hair the barbarian queen, the daughter of dogs that... The hour has struck, said Aslan, and Rabidash saw to his supreme horror that everyone had begun to laugh. They couldn't help it. Rabidash had been wagging his ears all the time, and as soon as Aslan said, The hour has struck, the ears began to change. They grew longer and more pointed, and soon they were covered with gray hair. And while everyone was wondering where they'd seen ears like that before, Rabidash's face began to change too. It grew longer and thicker at the top and larger eyed, and the nose sank back into the face, and, or else the face swelled out and it became all nose, and there was hair all over it. And his arms grew longer, and they came down in front of him till his hands were resting on the ground. Only they weren't hands now, they were hooves and he was standing on all fours, and his clothes disappeared, and everyone laughed louder and louder because they couldn't help it, and for what had been Rabidash was simply and unmistakably a donkey. The terrible thing was that his human speech lasted just a moment longer than his human shape, so that when he realized the change was coming over him, he screamed out, Oh, not a donkey! Mercy! If it were even a horse! Even a horse! <laughs> and so the words died away into a donkey's bray. Ugh. Now hear me, Rabidash, said Aslan. Justice shall be mixed with mercy. You shall not always be a donkey. At this, of course, the donkey twitched its ears forward, and that also was so funny that everyone laughed all the more. They tried not to, but, but they tried in vain. You have appealed to Tash, said Aslan, and in the temple of Tash you shall be healed. You must stand before the altar of Tash in Tashban at the great autumn feast this year. And there, in the sight of all Tashban, your donkey's shape will fall from you, and all men will know you for Prince Rabidash. But as long as you live, if you ever go more than ten miles away from the great temple in Tashban, you shall instantly become again as you now are. And from that second change, 
there can be no return. There was a short silence, and then they all stirred and looked at one another as if they were waking from a sleep. But Aslan was gone. But there was a brightness in the air and on the grass, and a joy in their hearts, which assured them that they had been in no dream, and anyway, there was the donkey right in front of them. King Loon was the kindest-hearted of men, and on seeing his enemy in this regrettable condition, he forgot all his anger. Your Royal Highness, I, I am most truly sorry that things have come to this extremity. Your Highness will bear witness that it was none of our doing, and of course, we shall be delighted to provide Your Highness with shipping back to Tashban for the uh, treatment which Aslan has prescribed. You shall have every comfort which Your Highness's situation allows, the best of cattle boats, the freshest carrots and thistles. But a deafening bray from the donkey and a well-aimed kick at one of the guards made it clear that these kindly offers were ungratefully received. And here, to get him out of the way, I'd better finish off this story about Rabidash. He, or it, was duly sent back by boat to Tashban and brought into the Temple of Tash at the Great Autumn Festival, and then he became a man again. But, of course, four or five thousand people had seen the transformation, and the affair could not possibly be hushed up. And after the old Tisrock's death, when Rabidash became Tisrock in his place, he turned out to be the most peaceable Tisrock Kalorman had ever known. This was because, not daring to go more than ten miles from Tashban, he couldn't ever go to war himself. And he didn't want his Tarkans to win fame in the wars at his expense, because that's the way Tisrocks get overthrown. But though his reasons were selfish, it made things much more comfortable for all the smaller countries around the Kalorman. His own people never forgot that he had been a donkey, and during his reign, to his face... They called him Rabidash the Peacemaker. But after his death and behind his back, he was called Rabidash the Ridiculous. And if you look him up in a good history of Kalorman, you could try the local library. You will find him under that name. And to this day in Kalorman schools, if you do anything unusually stupid, you are very likely to be called a second Rabidash. Meanwhile, at Anvard, everyone was very glad that he had been disposed of before the real fun began which was a grand feast held that evening on the lawn before the castle, with dozens of lanterns to help the moonlight. And the tales were told, and jokes were cracked, and then silence was made, and the king's poet, with two fiddlers, stepped out into the middle of the circle. And Erebus and Kor prepared themselves to be bored, for the only poetry they knew was the Kalormian kind. And you know what that was like. But at the very first scrape of the fiddles, a rocket seemed to go up inside their heads, and the poet sang the great old lay of Fair Alvin, and how he fought the giant pyre and turned him into a stone. That's the origin of Mount Pyre, by the way. It was a two-headed giant. And he won the Lady Liln for his bride. And when it was over, they wished it was going to begin again, and though Bree couldn't sing, he told the story of the fight of Zalindra. And Lucy told again. They had all, except Erebus and Kor, heard it many times, but they all wanted to hear it again, the tale of the wardrobe, and how she and King Edmund and Queen Susan and Peter the High King had first come into Narnia. And presently, as was certain to happen sooner or later, King Loon said it was time for young people to be in bed. And tomorrow, Kor, shall come over all the castle with me and see the esters and mark in strength and weakness. For I will be thine to guard when I'm gone. It will be thine to guard. But Corin will be the king then, father, said Kor. Nay, lad, thou art my heir. The crown comes to me. But I don't want it. I'd, I'd far... No, uh, tis no question what thou wantest, Kor. Nor I either. Tis in course of law. But if we're twins, we must be the same age. Nay, one must come first, said the king. You are Corin's elder by full twenty minutes, and is better too, let's hope, though that's no great mastery. And he looked at Corin with a twinkle in his eyes. But, father, couldn't you make whichever you like to be the next king? No, the king's under the law. It's the law that makes him king. Hast no more power to start away from thy crown than any sentry from his post. Oh, dear, I don't want to be king at all. And Corin, oh, I'm, mo I'm most dreadfully sorry. I never dreamed of my turning up was going to chisel you out of your kingdom. Hooray, hooray, I, I shan't have to be king. I shan't have to be king. I'll always be a prince. It's princes have all the fun. And that's truer than thy brother knows, Cor, said King Loon. For this is what it means to be a king. To be first in every desperate attack and last in every desperate retreat. And when there's hunger in the land, as must be now and then in bad years to wear finer clothes and laugh louder over a scantier meal than any man in your land. Well, when the two boys were going upstairs to bed, Cor asked again if Corin asked Corin again if nothing could be done about it, and Corin said, If you say another word, I, I'll knock you down. It would be nice to end the story by saying that after that the two brothers never disagreed about anything again, but I'm afraid it wouldn't be true. In reality, they fought and fought just about as often as any other two boys would, 
and all their fights ended if they didn't begin that way, with Kor getting knocked down. For though when they both grown up and become swordsmen, Kor was the, more, most, the more dangerous man in battle, neither he nor anyone else in the North Countries could ever equal Corin as a boxer. That was how he got the name of Corin Thunderfist, and how he performed his great exploit against the lapped, lapsed bear of Stormness, which was really a talking bear, but had gone back to wild bear habits. Corin climbed up to its lair on the Narnian side of Stormness one day, when the winter with snow was on the hills, and boxed it without a timekeeper for thirty-three rounds. And at the end it couldn't see out of its eyes, and it became a reformed character. Erebus also had many quarrels, and I'm afraid even fights with Kor, but they always made it up later. So that years later, when they'd grown up, they were so used to quarreling and making it up again that they got married, so as to going on, go on doing it more conveniently. And after King Loon's death, they made a good king and queen of Arkenland, and Ram the Great, the most famous of all the kings of Arkenland, was their son. Bree and Wynne lived happily to a great age in Narnia, and both got married, but not to one another. And there weren't many months in which one or both of them didn't come trotting over the past to visit their friends at Onvard. End of the book. What do you think, guys? All right. Well, I think we've got time for a song. Let's pull that out, push this in, and we can all sing along as we listen. I like this song, Unger. Me too, Spark. Should we sing along? I guess so. Let's do it. Yeah. Charlie Brown, you gotta sing too. Okay, guys, I'm here. I'm ready to roll. Let's go. Sure does have a good beat. Yeah, it doesn't sound like any birthday song I've ever heard. I don't know about you. Now everybody has a birthday, and a cake and a party too. And all your friends come over and sing happy birthday to you. Birthday, baby Jesus. Even when your birthday is through, all year long we'll remember these precious gifts we get from you. Now we we'll sing la 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 la. He was born. So you guys like that song? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You know what I forgot to do? I forgot to announce the winners of the Far Out Contest, oh. and we're almost out of time. They're going to be very angry if they don't hear. Okay, here we go. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's read the letters real quick first. 
First, we've got a letter from Mount Gilead. And it says, Hi, my name is Vicki. I will be five years old, March 31st. I have twin sisters, Lisa and Sarah, who will be three, July 1st. Uh, I would like to enter the Far Out Contest. I live in Mount Gilead, which is about 20 miles from Marion and Mount Vernon. If I win, I'd like a cassette in Christ, Vicki Novotny. Uh, P.S. Mommy wrote this for me. And Vicki, I'm sorry, we didn't get your letter open in time to get you in a birthday club. Happy birthday to you. Happy, come on, sing fast. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Vicki. Happy birthday to you. you. Oh, my. That wasn't very good, you guys. You've got to sing louder. <laughs> okay, the next letter is from uh, London, Ohio. And we just have a couple of entries here, I think, for the Far Out Contest. Uh, it's from the Hayslip family, if I'm reading this correctly, of London. Paul and Candy. Uh, one is age 10, Paul is age 10, and Candy is age 12, and I think they were entering the Far Out contest. And the final letter, oops, nope, sorry, there are two, but I think we're going to save one till next week because it's kind of supposed to be a secret. Dear Charlie Brown, Sparky and Unger, I would like to enter the Far Out contest. I live in Bucky Russ, is that, no, that's not right, Bucyrus, Ohio. Uh, I'm not sure how far that is from Columbus. I'm in the seventh grade, 12 years old, and go to uh, Colonel Crawford International School, INT. I think my name and my brother's and sister's names are already in the birthday club, but here they are anyway, and then goes on and gives them all. There's Brian and Karen, uh, and it says, When you're done reading Chronicles of Narnia, I think you should read The Runaway by Patricia M. St. John. It's about a boy in Jesus' time whose sister is possessed by a demon. I really like the songs you play. Your listeners, Jennifer, Brian, and Karen Lutold. And they're from, not Bucky Russ, but Bucyrus, Ohio. So, now, counting all those people in, everybody involved, here are the winners of the Far Out Contest. Uh, the fourth further, actually, we had a tie for third, so we had to give four away, okay? Uh, in a tie for third, Debbie and Sarah Harpster of Sycamore, Ohio. Sycamore is uh, pretty far away. It's up on the other side of uh, Mount Vernon. Uh, of Marion, and it's quite a ways away. And they were the, uh, actually we had two entries from Sycamore, also Michelle Gregg from Sycamore. So both of them will be receiving prizes. We're sending out the Music Machine Club Fun Album, and uh, we had two records and two cassettes to give away. That's the way it worked. And so the two furthest people away chose cassettes, so you guys, even though I think you wanted cassettes, are going to get records. So Michelle Gregg and Debbie and Sarah Harpster, all from Sycamore, Ohio, were the third and fourth furthest away. The second furthest away was the Best Family. There was a whole bunch of them in that family, like five of them, so I'm not going to give you all their names. And they live in Stark, Stockport, Ohio, which is down near Marietta, down near the river. That's real far away. And the furthest of all, we just heard from him last week, Joey Crispin of Parkersburg, West Virginia. Hey, our first out-of-state person. Let's give him a big hand, you guys. Hey, hey, come on, clap. Congratulations to our winners of the Far Out Contest, and uh, that's, that's going to do it. So you guys want to say goodbye? Say it real loud. Bye. Say bye, Mom and Dad and everybody. Bye, everybody. One, two, three. Bye. bye. Well, thanks for coming by. It was great having you here. And we'll see you, we'll see you guys another time, okay? Bye. That's just about going to do it for us, especially for kids. I'm the real Charlie Brown. It's two minutes past 11 o'clock at Ohio's number one Christian radio station, AM88 WRFD, Columbus Worthington. I say again, that's AM88 WRFD, Columbus Worthington. We'll see you next Saturday morning. We'll have some uh, adventures from Agape Land along with uh, Narnia next week.